G'day everyone, Wesley here from the Mental Awareness Foundation and uh, we're doing an under the radar series here today but also doing an introduction for our newest ambassador, Mr. Matt Rogers, thank you. No um, listen now, if you've been living under a rock for a long time, those that don't know Matt Rogers, uh, I'll, I, I have a sheet of accomplishments <laughs> here, uh, yeah. we had to actually shorten it. But um, not only is Matt our newest ambassador at the Mental Awareness Foundation, but just to give you a little bit of history about Matt, he's been a peak performance athlete. He actually played rugby league in the, uh, the 90s, which is where I grew up, and the uh, early 2000s, played for Australia and Queensland in the league, but then actually jumped ship to my favourite code, would you believe, to uh, rugby union, uh, and, and played for the Wallabies. Uh, played for the Reds? No, and, the, no Waratahs. the Waratahs. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, uh, for the Waratahs. Uh, however, I guess in both codes, played at the ultimate level for his country as well. So, um, Matt Rogers, thank you very much for coming on board as a MAP ambassador. Pleasure, mate. Couldn't, uh, couldn't be happier. No, and mate, obviously, you know, we're all things mental health, right? And, um, you know, it, it, it does interest me the pressure that you would have had in between both codes. Mate, how did you manage just with your own mental health, with the switch, or how would you, with that intensity coming from different directions? Well, it's, it's interesting you ask that question because, you know, a lot of people look at professional athletes and think, oh, you know, what a life, it should be so easy, you know, you're getting paid to play sport. But I, I remember when I, first, I signed my first big contract, I was young, you know, I was probably about 20 years old, and all of a sudden it dawned on me, yeah. like, wow, like, they're paying me all this money, oh, I have to perform now. Yes. And... You know, the public can be pretty cruel at times, you know, and they can let you know when you're not performing. So, um, yeah, it's tough. I mean, it's, it's not the easiest of professions. You're open to public scrutiny. Yep. Uh, and that can break you down sometimes. Yep. And there were times, you know, definitely, you know, throughout my career when I was in slumps or, you know, I was injured, where your mental health does take a bit of a battering. And yep. you sort of start to question whether you're doing the right thing. And, and I guess that's where the importance of your team and your family and your close friends yep. really come to the fore. Yep. And actually, Matt, I, I must, I, we're, we're actually similar ages, you know, I, I'm, for, I'm now 40. Uh, but, mate, if we go back to, because I, I grew up in the 90s, yeah. you know, what was life growing up like you back at, back at school or in those, those periods there? Oh, mate, it was great. I mean, I, had, oh, I went to the Southport School on the yep. Gold Coast, so I was a boarder there and, you know, I, I lived the dream, you know, I lived in this, you know, palatial place, you know, the beautiful grounds and, you know, you know, the best technology surrounded by 100-year-old beautiful yeah. buildings, you know, right on the river. And, um, you know, I always said that, well, I, you know, I read, you know, the, the story about, you know, to become an expert in anything, you've got to spend 10,000 hours doing it, you know. And I was told that as a youngster. So I, I reckon, you know, from the age of sort of 13 to 17, when I was in boarding school, I would have spent 10,000 hours on those fields with a ball in my hand, yep. you know, kicking it with my mates, you know, just... I lived and breathed, you know, to the chagrin of my teachers, football, you know, yep. I wanted to be a professional sportsman. Yes. Um, they all sort of uh, <laughs> said, said that I couldn't because you, you don't make money playing rugby. But my dad always told me, he said, he said, I don't care what you're doing. He said, if you're the best in the world yeah. at it, you can, get, you can make it pay. Yes. And uh, that was my focus, you know, I was one-eyed. Anybody who was in my circle knew that I wanted, what I wanted to do. And um, yeah, I was going to go after it. So, you know, my childhood, I, I was blessed in a way. You know, I got to follow my father, who was, you know, a, an Australian, um, he captained Australia yep. in rugby league. So I had that sort of pathway to follow. But I also had, you know, a school that um, had everything sort of laid out for me to become the best that I possibly yep. could. I mean, I had to embrace it and I had to go after it, but um, okay. it was all there for me. And uh, I loved it. Um, you know, I, I, I wanted to play at the highest level but I also had spent a lot of time researching how many times father and sons had played for Australia yep. and all that oh, sort wow. of stuff and I was I, I realized like it, it wasn't going to be easy because you know I knew I might a door might be open because of who my dad was and yep. my name but unless I could kick it in unless I could perform then pe I'm just going to get brushed to the wayside yep. um, no one would want to be that guy that gave me a job just because of who my dad was and be criticized for it publicly you know, in the professional setting. So I knew I had to work hard. So I worked really hard and, um, you know, loved it. And yeah, when the opportunity arose, I made sure I, I put you the foot it. down. 
And mate, going back to those early years, do you, do you genuinely remember any struggles that you had? You know, sport or school or friends? You know, was there sort of certain periods that if you look back now, you go, yeah, okay, no, that was tough? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, there's plenty. Um, you know, going through my, my schooling life, you know, I, I got a, a scholarship to go to the Southport School. Yep. And, you know, my, although my dad had played for Australia, that was back in the days when no one really made any money. Mm -hmm. So we weren't a very wealthy family at all. We didn't have a lot. And, um, you know, I went to this school where <laughs> yeah. a lot of kids had a lot. And I, and I, I really felt like I was struggling to fit in yep. there for a while. And, you know, really, you know, for the first six to eight months, I, I hated it, to be mm -hmm. honest. But you know, it became the making of me that school, but it was a real struggle to, yep. to connect with the kids there. And um, fortunately, when the football season came around, I was able to sort of sink my teeth into that. And, and But, you know, going through, you know, school, uh, you know, like any kid, you know, there's a lot of pressures, and I think more so today than ever. Yes. You know, I mean, the pressures for us back in those days were, you know, getting your homework in on time and finishing your assignments. And, you know, I feel for, for teenagers in this day and age with social media and all that they go yeah. through, you know, the pressure on these kids to be something or well, you know, I, create something that they're not to, to maybe fit in. I, yes. I feel like there's just way too much pressure on our kids nowadays. And, and here's a question, because I, I, I've obviously been similar age or vintage, like we were pre-internet mm. and, you know, we saw all, all, what, what life was before yeah. all social media and internet and now we're obviously being uh, exposed to that all. You know, what, and you've got kids, you know, what are some of the differences that you see that are challenges that, you know, I guess if you could go back and not have any social media mm. that we could tell kids today, go, hey, you know, perhaps do this more rather than yeah. being so enthused with Well, I think, you know, back in our internet. day, no, no one had access to you. Yes. You yep. know, like, no one could get to you, you know, and you could, you could, oh, I could stay at home and I'd, I'd be fine or I could, you know. Nowadays, I mean, uh, the social media came in, Twitter had started in my, the last few years of my career. And it was just, I, I got on board, I, you know, I was excited about it, and I was having yep. a bit of fun with it. And then all of a sudden, people started adding me. And I'm like, what's going on here? Like, <laughs> these people, then they're like bagging me. And these yep. are faceless people behind the keyboard. Yes. But it, it affected me. It yep. really affected me. Like, I was like, wow. Because I, like, I feel like I'm a nice bloke, I'm likeable, <laughs> you know, I'm not, I'm not an asshole, no. you know, like, and, I was just blown away at these opinions that people had of me and it, and it started to sort of break me down a little bit. And yeah. I had to, I've, I've many times throughout my life, I've, I've just sort of, you know, shut social media down just yeah. for that reason. I just had to get away from it because, you know, you can, you know, have this exterior of, you know, I'm this tough, hard guy, but internally we've all got a heart, we all, you know, we've all got emotions. And, um, you know, I think sometimes people forget that. And, you know, in those teenage years, you know, when you're not as mature as, as you are when you grow yeah. up, um, you know I, I don't think a lot. Of, I don't think kids would shut it down. I think they, you know, fight it. And, yeah. You know, I, and, I, and I think it's a fight that it's not worth having. And you know, I, I was told as a, as a youngster by my dad, you know, you got to pick your battles, and yeah. you know, some of them are just not worth having. And the whole social media world—that's um, a battle that's not worth having. I mean, it's 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 useful, and it's you know, it's a good tool for certain things. But you know, I feel for the for the younger generation that, that what they're going through having to, you know, create something that, you know, to, to fulfill some sort of person that they are or they are, yeah. you know, it's just, it's a, it's a tough world and, and, you know, even in this day and age, you know, I mean, I'll tell you, I mean, football fans are mad, yeah. but I'll tell you who are the maddest fans, Survivor fans. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and man, that was a, they, that, that, that. They throw some kid oh, criticism. Mate, that, yeah. that, that, that nearly broke me, that show, yeah. after I finished wow. the first season. Yep. You know the social media aspect of that was heavy, and, and I think uh, I think what we're actually talking about is just it's another form of bullying, right? Absolutely. And um, obviously, bullying we particularly in the mental health space see the negative outcomes of that. Yeah. And you know, if you're watching this and you know of someone being bullied or whatnot, you know, perhaps just go and have a conversation with them, Absolutely. or perhaps even you know call them out because, mate. At the end of the day, I think if you strip it, strip that away, we're all good people. Yeah. But you know, just sit behind a keyboard and throw some toxic comments, you, you don't know what that's gonna, how that's gonna affect that person. Well, you know, I, I've always, you know, lived by the the notion that hurting people hurt people. Yeah. You know what yeah, I mean? And, well and sometimes, like you say, you know, you reach out to that person who is being the bully and go, hey, what, you know, what's yep. going on? You know, this isn't you, or yeah, you know, this is not your mo. Like, what, you know. What's happening in your life? Like, let me help you sort it out because you know sometimes um, you know that 
things come from a bad place, and the bad place is, is the person that they're, what they're going through, what they're living, you know, yeah. and um, they haven't got someone to reach out to, so they lash out, yeah. you know, and uh, yeah, look, we can all use a hand at times. Yeah, totally, and I, I think it's just sort of, you know, if you find yourself in that situation, just take the time to think, you know, if I do say this, what, you know, what could potentially happen? What are the happen? repercussions? What are the yeah. repercussions? Yeah, absolutely. Mate, you've spoken about your dad, yep. Steve Rogers. Yep. Um, just tell me a little bit about your dad. Oh, mate, he was, he was, you know, I grew up, you know, my dad was every kid's hero. Yeah. You know, like I lived in Cronulla. Uh, my dad was the captain of Cronulla. He was the captain of New South Wales. He captained Australia. Um, and he was every kid's hero, you know, yep. like, and he, but he was my hero, you know, and he was just the most lovely man, you know, like he was, he was such a good guy. Like he just would go out of his way to help people all the time. And we'd rock up the games and there were kids would just swarm him. I remember just like standing there holding mum's hand and just looking at my dad, just surrounded by like a hundred kids. He's just signing autographs and mum would go, oh, well, I'll take the kids, you know, and we'd walk away. And I'm like, but why do we have to walk away? <laughs> yeah. Dad's working, you know, and he would not leave any kid without an autograph. You now we'd go and do stuff that nobody ever knew about. You know, he'd go and visit kids in hospital. He'd go and do stuff that, and he wasn't doing it because he was just a, wasn't doing it for publicity. That's why no yeah. one knew about it. You know, after he passed away, I got so many messages from families. You know, just, it was, it blew me away. You know, like I didn't even know about it. Like he, you know, a family's young boy would, you know, have cancer and he'd go and yeah. see him and take a jersey in and see the kid and brighten his day or go and visit a little girl who's been struggling at school or, you know, being bullied and, you know, the family's reached out and he's gone and helped out. You know, like just so many stories like that. And that was, you know, I'm so proud of that because that's what I, I, I sort of knew that that was him, but I didn't know what he was doing behind the scenes. Yep. Like he was doing stuff that I never knew about. And, you know, I, I think after I heard those stories, it, it lit a fire in me to make sure that I do what I could to help people that needed a hand, you know. And was there ever an occasion that really stood out to you when you were young where you are like, whoa, Dad's doing that? Not really, because he, he kept kept his cards pretty close yep. to his chest in that regard. But... but it, what what really stood out to me was was just how how um, available he was to yes. his fans yep. and, and how caring by and the caring, yeah, and, yeah. And he would sign everything. Like there'd, there'd be a hundred kids lined up, and he'd sign everyone. Yep. He wouldn't walk away from any kid. You know, like yep. he'd stay there and sign everything until everything was signed. And that was just the way he was. And you know, he he knew that you know without those people, like he wouldn't have a job. You know, like and that's. You know, it sort of annoys me a little bit sometimes when, when I see, you know, celebrity and, yep. you know, athletes or performers, you know, they, they sort of get a bit shirty with people. It's yeah. like, I mean, these, these are the people them, that are paying yeah, your wages. That's right. You know, like, yeah. you might be worth millions, but without your fans, you're worth nothing, you know, and... And did yeah. that influence with you in your career that you made sure that you made, took time for your uh, fans and said Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, whatnot. absolutely. It had a huge influence on me. Yep. And... You know, look, I, I'm not to say I got it right all the time, but, yeah. you know, 100% of the time I was trying. Sounds know, like and, you're human, mate. Yeah, well, <laughs> you know, we all make mistakes, don't we? But, look, at the end of the day, you know, like, I, I, I felt so blessed to have the career that I had. And, you know, <laughs> just in reference to that, you know, I, I went away with my daughter on a, on a, on a, she played for a rep side and we were away for four days up in Harvey Bay. And, you know, she's with her team and they had this amazing week. And then on the last day, she's crying, you know, she, she has to, she's like, oh, I'm going to miss everyone, it's been amazing. I said, you know what you've just experienced, bub? I said, you've just experienced what I experienced for 17 years. Yeah. I said, you can have this as a life. Yes. If you're a professional, this is your life as a professional athlete. You're doing what you love, you're doing it with your mates, and they pay you to do it. Yeah. You know, and I was never one to, you know, I was never expectant. Like, well, I was expectant, but I was never not grateful. You know, I was never not, you know, I didn't have this attitude of, you know, you know, of course I should have this because, you know, I was, I was always grateful for what yeah. was afforded to me. And, you know, if I can help a kid have that life or, you know, help a kid, you know, smile, you know, he's going through a tough time, I was always happy to do it yeah. because, you know, I lived, oh, well, I still live an amazing life, but I lived in a, like for 17 years, I travelled the world, got paid a bucket load of money yeah. and I got to do what I would have done for free. If there was something that you're grateful for, your dad, what would that be? What was something that uh, you're hugely grateful for? Uh, it took me a while to, yep. to, to really be grateful for this, but how hard he was on me as a kid. Yep. Like he was, he was tough on me. 
you yes. know, and and as a as a kid, I used to get so upset, cry to mum, you know, and mum would try to soften it all. <laughs> But he was he was really hard, you know. Like he he would he would not like he'd done what I was trying to do. So he he would not pull punches. He'd tell me exactly what I needed to do. Or if I wasn't doing it, he'd get on me about it. And I used to just and I and I used to take it as like he's not he's not appreciating what yes. I'm doing. He's focused too much on the stuff I'm not doing. But but well, he, he realised like best for you. It's, it's what I'm not doing is what yeah. gonna, it's what's going to stop me from getting yes. to where I want to go. And um, it wasn't until I was about 23 or 24. When I really could reflect, you know, like as a, you know, as a young 20, 20 year old or, you know, or I do seven, remember. 18 year old, <laughs> you know, you, you know everything, you know, like I know, I know best. And uh, my dad was, was certainly one that would make sure that, you know, and he would just laugh and just, but right, I, I, think, I think I'm doing good and he'd just shake his head and he's like, yeah. mate, you're not even close. You're not even close to where you need to be. And I'm just like, what? I'm playing in these rep sides. I'm just against, yeah, but you're one of a thousand kids yes. who wants that one position. Yeah. You know, like, why, why are they going to pick you over those other kids if you're not doing this, this, and this? And it made me realise, you know, like, I wanted to play in the NRL. At that yeah. time, there was, you know, 16 teams. I wanted to play 5-8 in the NRL. There was only 16 blokes that got a job every week in the whole country. Yeah. <laughs> so how am I going to... Especially when you break it down like that. How am I going to be yeah. that guy? Yeah. You know, so... He made sure that I was aware. Yes. And um, it wasn't until later in life that I realised what he was doing for me. I hated it at the time. Yeah. And um, you know, speaking to my kids now, they hate hate it at the time too because I tell them. <laughs> you know, I, I think I should do it with a little bit more love though. Yes. Yeah, you know, my old man was hard. It, yeah. He was old school. You know, like my grandfather was, you know, hard. Um, but you know, look at the end of the day, um, you know, I reflect back on those times and I'm just thinking, man, I'm so glad. Because if he hadn't have told me those things, I would have I would have just coasted. Because I was I had talent. Yeah. I would have coasted. I would have just had the talent. But talent's not enough. You know, you got to put the work in. I we we were blessed that we actually shared a lunch together um, at uh, the port office about three or four months ago. Time flies. Yeah. Um, and mate, one stood one thing that stood out from uh, your speech there was um, obviously we lost your father to self harm. Yeah. But the one thing that really hit me is that you, you, you said this, I don't want that act to, to, to define my father. No. And I found that so powerful because I think sometimes when these things happen, it's really easy to put it in that box and go, oh, we'll shut that box, that's all. Yeah. Are and you happy to elaborate yeah, on that? Because well, I, I think, thought it was quite you know, good, sometimes, powerful. and I think I talked about it that day, sometimes we, like we, my, my dad, People who knew my dad, or people that know me and yeah. know what happened with my dad, they won't want to. They don't want to talk about my yes. dad. Yes. <laughs> yes. You know, it's like, you know, my dad was one of the greatest rugby league players this country's ever seen. He's in the Hall of Fame. Personally, I think he should be an immortal. I think if he'd won a premiership, he would be immortal, an immortal. You know, every every one of his older players that he played with just shake their head. And think, man, he was the greatest athlete we ever saw. He could do everything. Yeah. So, for for a guy that had achieved so much in his life, to now be defined by an act that finished his life. Um, it, it was frustrating for me, and, and, and I say it a lot, and I, I, it's not something that I, don't, I just, I said there, you know, on that day. Yeah. Anytime I get the opportunity to speak about my dad, I like to talk about that because I love talking about my dad. I love talking about his achievements. I love talking about what he, you know, the family he raised, you know, the, the amazing things that he'd done. And I don't want people to feel like they can't talk to me about yeah. my dad. I don't want them to feel awkward about it because, you know, I, I, I bumped into an old fella not long ago and we sat down and he goes, oh, I knew your dad. And, and I get that a lot, like, oh, I knew, yeah. I knew your dad. And, and then he said, oh, I used to play cards with him. And then I thought, oh, you definitely know my dad. Because <laughs> <laughs> you know, he only played cards with a few people. And he loved his cards and stuff. And then we, we got talking and he started talking about, you know, particular games that, you know, where he saw my dad do this and that. And it was stuff that I'd never heard coming from, you know, another opinion of what they'd seen. It was just, yeah. it was, I loved it. It was so moving to sit there. And I, I wanted to sit there for hours and just talk, you know. We actually did sit there for quite a while and, and talk. And it got a bit emotional, actually. And, and um, yeah, it was a pretty special time. But, um, yeah, look, I, I want people to feel, and, and I'm sure there are many people in the world who have lost someone yeah. to suicide. And, and there are many people, and it's sort of like the taboo thing that, yeah that doesn't get talked about 
well, okay, we don't need to talk about the event. Yes. You know, but but we can talk about the great times. Yep. You know, the, and sometimes that might bring up some pain. You know, but you know, look, I think um, yeah, it's something that needs to be spoken about more because you know I, I don't want I don't want my dad's legacy to be that he killed himself. Yeah. Like it's it's just it's, it's too much more to him than that. You know, and. Um, and I think, you know, the fact that suicide and, and mental health and, you know, it's just so much, it's at the forefront of, of discussion nowadays. Yes. Um, what, what I don't want to be is it's okay to, for suicide to take place and then we yep. can talk about it all right. Like, it's, no, no, it's not, not what I'm saying. But, you know, I think, I think we're mature enough now. We, we've, we understand mental health a lot more than what we did, you know, 20 years ago. I agree. That, you know, we can, we can talk comfortably about you know our loved ones that are not with us anymore and talk about those good times and and even bring up what might have caused it yeah to help you know like if we don't address it then we, we can't find answers to making sure that it doesn't happen again or well, we know it's going to happen again in, time, in parts of the world at different times but if we're not addressing the causes and the reasons then how are we ever going to yeah. limit it yeah you know, and that's, it's important to me because, and you know, I've got, I've got four kids, you know, I've got a brother and a sister and, you know, I've got extended family that I love to death, close friends that I love to death. And I want to know everything that I need to know about suicide and mental health so that I can address an issue if I see it. Yeah. Because, because I've been in, in, in situations personally where I haven't wanted to say anything. Mm. And fortunately my wife saw it. And she's like asked me some questions and we dealt with some situations and I had friends flying from all over the world and spent time with me and I ended up going and seeing a psychologist about it and and it was it was important. Yeah. You know, that she saw something. Because she was, spoke up. That's, I wasn't, that's a great thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well she asked me and I'm like, Yeah, I'm I'm hurt and this is what's going on in my head here and you know, fortunately we got to the bottom of it and everything was okay and um, but who knows where that could have festered. Yeah. You know, if we hadn't been through what we'd been through and my wife hadn't been on top of sort of my situation, sort of looking closely and just sort of like going, what's going on here? This isn't you. Yep. You know, let's deal with this. And I, and I was able to open up to her. But I, I don't think I would have opened up to her if she hadn't come to me. Because I was scared, you know, I was really scared. So it's a tough one. And that just underlines the importance of, you know, if you have got that special friend or your loved one, you know, go up to ask them, you know, are you okay? You yeah, know? yeah. Uh, or one way, I, or what I, how I approach is, how is your mental health? Yeah. Well, it's mental awareness, right? Like, it's, it's like, like, I, I, I think I'm aware, I think I'm aware of my mental yep. stability. Like, I think I'm aware of it, but, but I think it's all, also, it's like, as a, as a, as an adult, with, with friends and family that I care deeply about. I think it's, it's sort of on me. I think I have a, a bit of a responsibility to understand signs, yep. to understand things, because I want to make sure that all my friends and family are, are, are okay. And like I said, because sometimes they, they, you know, like I wasn't going to talk about it. Yep. And I, I'm embarrassed to say that, but I was scared. I was, I was, I was scared of what, what was going on. You know, and uh, it was it just it stemmed after a friend of mine had committed suicide, and I'd seen him a, few, a, a couple of months earlier, and he and he and he told me, you know, what he was going through, and I'm like, right, we're gonna we're gonna talk, we're gonna, you know, we're gonna stay in touch, we're gonna get some help, and then um, he messaged me the day that he committed suicide, but he messaged me this lovely picture yeah. of him and another mutual friend of ours, they all together, and I'm like, oh, he's good, he's in a good spot, that's good. And then he took his life that night and it just rattled me. It just took me back to what happened with dad. It took me back to just a real dark place. And it wasn't, and I, and I was scared. I was like, what's going on here? You know, what's going on in this world? And um, yeah, that, that, that was the thing that threw me. And I was scared to talk to anyone about it because I wasn't sure what was going on. Yeah. So fortunately my wife picked up on it and um, you know, because she, obviously she's, she was friends of his as well, and, and obviously she lived through what we'd gone through with Dad. And she was like, well, "Yeah, we're, we're going to get on top of this quick," you know. So, um, 
and that was her awareness of my mental health. You know, that, so I think it's important. You know, that awareness isn't just about that self-awareness. It's about the awareness of those around you, because sometimes, a lot of times, when you're in that hole, and this is, you know, I got told this, you know, after I spoke to um, the doctor after my dad had, had committed suicide, I'm like, why would he not speak to me about things? And, and ultimately, the doctor said he he thought his best option, he yes. thought he was a problem. Yeah. He was creating issues for everybody, and his best issue, his best solution to that was to not be here. He didn't do it out of selfishness. He did it out of love, thinking he was helping you. Made me feel a little better, but I'm like far out, man. Like that's that's heavy. Yeah. You know. And I guess you know. And thank you for opening up about your friend. I, I wasn't aware yeah. of that. But you know, looking back now, like what are some of the things that you've learnt out of that? That you know, you, you could have perhaps engaged prior to those events, or that you now. What are some of the lessons that you're instilling in yourself? Well, I think probably the most important thing is professional help. Yep. Yeah, you and know, being like, okay with it. Yeah, yep. like, like a, you know, one of the things, you know, you, you, can, you can ask your mate if he's okay. And if he's not okay, then it's, it's not on you to make him okay. There, there are people out there that are trained professionally to do that. Yep. And don't, that, that burden can be, a big burden to carry if you think you're going to be the one you're not professionally trained you're a friend you love you care of course but it's not your job to be that I'm, I'm going to get you through this you know and um, probably the most important thing I've learned over this period is is to be able to to I, I guess facilitate a pathway to professional help yeah. you know and, and make sure that I mean I, I've, I've sought it many times in my life like for many different reasons, um, you know, going through a, a breakdown of marriage, you know, the loss of my father, the loss of a close friend, um, struggles in my professional career. Yep. Um, it's, it's okay. And, and you know what, every time it's helped remarkably. And I think we need to remove the stigma of going to see someone to get help. Correct. Um, because if, you know, you've got a torn hamstring, you know, you go see a physio. <laughs> You know, like when, when something's sort of mixed up in here, yeah. like it's, it's an injury, mm. in a sense. For some reason we think, oh, she'll be, oh, she'll be she'll right, be right mate. Yeah. Let's, have a, let's go and have a beer and yeah. have a chat about it. But no, don't, don't yeah. drink alcohol and, and, and oh yeah, just, you know, it's, 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 it's sad because it's, you know, the, I don't, you know, I'm not, I'm not, you know, I'm not trying to be a, do, do good here, don't drink and don't, you know, like, you've got to live, you want to be happy yeah. and all that sort of stuff. But, you know, when, when, you're, when you're clouded mentally, the last thing you want to do is put things in there that's going to inhibit your mental capacity. And, you know, for me, you know, when I went through that time with, with uh, my friend over the last few years, I, you know, I just, you know, stopped drinking. So, you know, I yeah. took eight months of just, I just needed to, my life's too important to me. Yeah. My kids are too important to me, my family, my friends are too important to me to not be right. The most important thing um, for me in that situation was to get myself right because everything in my life is, is too important to me. You know, my family, my, my friends. Um, see, seeking professional help to do that, um, I wasn't, I wasn't overly keen to do that initially. Yeah. But after I did it the first time, Real it's life. like a hand up. I'm like, load me up. Can I buy a pack of ten <laughs> yeah. appointments here? <laughs> like, yeah, you know, buy nine get one free. Um, because literally, like it was, and some of the most you know, simple stuff for me to work through, I just needed someone to unlock that. And I needed a professional to do it, and um, boy, it made a difference. And I just, ladies and gentlemen, if you're watching this, this is coming from a professional athlete that it has reached the highest level. He's saying it's okay to seek help. So please, if, 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 if you can, like, share, because it is so true. And thank you for sharing that, mate. And you're absolutely right. There is a stigma behind seeing someone professional or we, we don't want to open up and say, hey, you know, yeah. I'm going to go do this or I'm going to go see this person. Um, mate, thank you for sharing that. Oh, no, no worries. I mean, I'm, <laughs> my, my wife and I are avid. Oh, we're, we're like, you know, psychologist evangelists. It's like someone comes to our house and they're like, they want me to go see someone. I can't help you with that. Yeah. Uh, mate, is, outside of a psychologist, is there, you know, you mentioned, you, you know, when things that are a little clouded, you'll stop drinking. Is there any other strategies that you use for yourself? You know, is exercise a yeah, big one? Yeah, and, look, exercise yeah. is, is critical for me. Um, 
you know, many, many former, you know, NRL players or rugby players, you know, they sort of, they finish and, you know, go and buy a pub and put on 15 kilos and get the old <laughs> RSL 10, the red face. And it's like, yeah, it wasn't really my go. I, I wanted to be active. I wanted to, to stay fit and healthy. And, and, you know, I must say, you know, when I retired from the NRL in my, my final retirement, it was 2010, I think. Um, well, actually, I came back and played a game in 2011. But after that game, I, I didn't put a pair of shoes on for 18 months. Like I, well, I, the only time I put shoes on was when I got on an aeroplane because they made okay. me put shoes on or I put thongs on. Like I, I just literally did nothing for 18 months. And after 18 months, I was in a bit of a bad place, yep. to be honest. And um, I remember my wife sitting down with me and she just sort of like put her hands up. She said, is this it? Is this our yep. life? Like, is this what it's going to be now after all the time you spent being fit and healthy, this is where, this is the path we're going down. And at the time I had a 14-year-old um, son, um, a 12-year-old daughter, and, uh, and, a, and a two and a three-year-old. And I thought, hmm, yeah, it's probably not the best example. So um, I started exercising and, and I got right into it, uh, <laughs> you know, to the point where I was doing Ironman triathlons and everything. And, and I got to tell you, it was a, it was a real, I realised that I needed it. Yeah. You know, I needed to be active. Yeah. Um, just those endorphins that's created from just getting out there and doing a bit of exercise, even if, even if it was you know going for a walk on the beach, you know, like just made a difference. Yeah. And um, yeah, so it's one of the things that I sort of continually sort of stay on top of. You know, I'm not as not as um, full on nowadays in terms of the Ironmans and stuff like that. But um, yeah, look, still you know, go for a ride on my bike, go for a walk with my wife, and um, yeah, it's just a a real pleasant way to, um, you know, remind yourself that, you know, life's good. Yeah, and uh, we're a big proponent of um, moving, put it yeah, that yeah. way, with uh, mental health and exercise and walking. Yeah. And actually the biggest one for us is getting outside. We're really a big promoter of just getting outside and breathing. The world's so sedentary, sed yeah. sedentary at the moment, you know, like everybody's at home, sitting down, yeah. on their computers. Yeah. It's, um, you know, I've seen some trainers, um, well, one of my good mates, Commando Steve, and uh, you know a heap of other trainers doing some at-home workouts, you know, just to keep people moving. Yeah. You know? And I, and I got to say, you know, during the whole COVID thing, um, I found myself in a bit of a funk after about six six months of just being stuck at home and not training and not doing anything, and just realised like, man, I'm probably I'm probably drinking too many beers and not doing enough yeah. exercise, and yeah, I needed to needed to refocus and. and it's not easy to do because you sort of, you know, when you're stuck at home and, you know, I played a team game my whole life, you know, I was always training with my mates and even when I started doing Ironman triathlon and stuff, I started a training group because I didn't want to train on my own. So, we, you know, we started the Rat Pack and, and there was like, there was like 70 members. You go to training any day, there's 30 people, you're, you know, chumming around and having a great time. Um, but I realised, you know, I don't need that anymore. Like I need, like I, I love that, yeah, but just, just yeah. me getting out. And just going for a ride on my own, or going for a you know forty minute walk, or, or something, and getting outside and just getting the fresh air in. I mean, it just makes a huge difference. Oh, there's mental health research that actually shows being just being outside or being in nature is great for yeah. your mental health. So now I just want to. You've been a busy man, so I'm just going to read here because <laughs> this 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 will blow you away. Uh, now you're the founder um, of Four ADS Kids Charity. ASD, ASD what, sorry, my yeah, apologies. ASD, thank you. Uh, which assists families in the needs affected by autism through funding therapy and therapy related resources. You're also the founder, which you mentioned, the Rat Pack yeah. Multi Sports, yeah. uh, which is based in the Gold Coast. And mate, I, I did not know this only because uh, it's written on this paper, but you've also written a book. I have, yes. Mate, oh, well, have... I have written a book. Um, I literally got the final manuscript yesterday. Yep. Uh, I got asked to do it. Yep. Um, yeah. Just about your life. Yeah, and, about yep. my life. Yeah, 18 months ago, I got a call from Simon and Schuster, the publishers, and they said, we want to do your life story. Uh, my agent said to me, do you, do you, I'll get a ghostwriter for you if you want, but do you want a ghostwriter or do you want to write it? And um, I thought, well, there's been so much stuff going in my life that I just didn't want to put through a second filter. Like, I just yep. wanted to put it down. Yeah. So that I know I'll write it, you know, and um, this was before I realised how hard it was to write a book. So... Um, about six months in, I thought, well, this is a bit harder than I thought. But um, I pressed on and, and got it done, and I'm really proud of it. It's, um, 
How was that reflection, you know, going oh. over those years? Was it an eye-opener? It, it and was hard. Shivers, I've done a lot. It was hard. Um, but the memories are all still there, but there, there were some pretty dark times that yep. I sort of went through, obviously, you know, with Dad and, and losing Mum. Like, Mum was my age when she passed oh, yeah. away with yeah. breast cancer and, and sort of fighting through all the, the emotional trauma that that created and just to sort of stay in, in the mindset I needed to be to be playing at the top level and... You know, I went through a marriage breakdown and had a child with autism and it was just like one of the things that um, sort of was my sanctuary was the football field. You know, like I, it, was my own, it was my sort of haven, it was my, my, my place where I could go and, and just, and I realised after writing the book, it was, it was the thing that saved me because it was, it was this place where I could just focus on playing and have my mates around me that supported me. Um, but writing the book was, was hard, I, you know, I had to, I had to dig up some, some, some dark yeah. times in my past and I, I would literally write for a few days and then I, I'd, have, I'd have to just leave it for yeah. a few weeks. And plus I wanted to get it all right, so I was speaking to a lot of my close relatives, my brother and sister, about sort of certain things that I had, a, I had a picture of in my mind of how it happened. Then after sort of conferring with others, I realised that wasn't the way it happened. And got it confirmed by a few other people and it sort of threw me for a bit of a loop that and some of the things that I'd painted in my own mind I'd painted them to make me feel better and then actually having to relive it uh, the actual way it happened was really hard so um, yeah it was uh, was writing it down somewhat therapeutic did it help you process those dark times I know I brought it up but yeah, yeah. sort of went wow you know I got through that it was a real cathartic experience yep. to be honest it was it was it was one of the you know, writing the book, when I finished it, I was like, wow, you know, that was such a... Yeah, my wife wrote a book um, a few years ago called Living With Max, and she would go away and she would write. And, uh, you know, at the time I was, I was playing, actually, and she was, we had the toddlers running around the house and she was trying to write a book. Yeah, she would go away and then come back, and I realised why she needed to go away now, because when you're surrounded by, like, you, you go into a, a real sort of a bit of a trance in, in sort of your memories and sort of digging them back up and putting them all down. And, and I realised why she was spending so much time away is because the emotion of it, like I'd come out of the, the office at my house where I was writing the book and I'd be in tears, you know, writing about stuff. And my, my son was like, what's up, what's up, Dad? You know, like, I'm like, oh, it's all right, Max. I'm, I'm, oh, you're upset. You know, and Max is autistic and he's very, um, like he picks up on everything, you know, so he, but he wants to know everything too. So like, why are you upset? You know, it's, like, it's all right, Max, I'm not upset. I've just been writing, you know, I was having to explain it to him and stuff. But, now, they were incredibly supportive throughout the whole process, the family. Um, yeah, they, they, uh, they got right behind me and helped me with bits and pieces. And um, my daughter, Phoenix, the, the last book that was written in our family obviously was about Max. So my daughter, Phoenix, was excited that she was going to be included in a book this time. So uh, it, was very, it was very cool. And was Max behind, uh, to me, clearly behind the, the development of the charity? Yeah, so, so the, the charity was founded 12 years ago now, or 13 years ago now. Um, we went through some incredibly tough times in those early days, just trying to find out answers and stuff. And ultimately, when we found the answers, it came with a huge price tag. So we wanted to do some things that um, would alleviate the, the, the burden of finance. Yep. Um, the burden of having an autistic child's enough, we figured. Mm -hmm. um, if we can do something to help families. That, and look, at the end of the day, um, the stuff that we did for Max, and I don't want to sound arrogant, the average family couldn't have done it. Yeah. You know, just wouldn't have had the money, you yeah. know. And, um, you know, it was a stretch for us. You know, it really was. And, you know, we, we drew down on our home loans and everything to, to wow. do what we had yeah. to do to, to help Max. Um, the average family just wouldn't have been able to do it. So we thought, it's just unfair. So we started the charity to sort of alleviate that and, and to help families. Um, fortunately, you know, in the last few years, the NDIS has come along and it's, it's been amazing. So we're sort of realigning sort of, you know, what our fundraising's sort of catered for now. We do a lot of stuff with um, programs and schools uh, because the NDIS funding now covers a lot of the kids' early intervention treatment that we were funding yep. prior. So, um, yeah, look, we're, we're still loving what we do and, um, you know, just to... You know, we had this saying in the early days, it's like, you know, we're not changing the world, but we're changing the world to one person. Yeah. You know, oh, and, and even you, just your community, right? You know, so, so it's, uh, that's the goal. And that's, it's just an observation that you've made, you know, obviously your dad gave his time for others yeah. and here you are, you know, 
seeing that for um, people with autism and having wanting to give back? Yeah, well, I think um, until you've done it, you don't realise, but giving's way more... <laughs> <laughs> yes. It's way more rewarding than taking, you know, and um, Ma Max, you know, I had a bit of a epiphany when Max was born, you know, that, that was, you know, after he got his diagnosis and we were living through that, you know, I was very focused and, you know, I was very, very consumed with my career and what I needed to do, you know, like it's, it's when you're a professional athlete, it's, it, it's like it's all consuming, you know, you, you play your game, you, you, you get you know, busted up and you're just trying to recover for the next week and everything revolves around you and what you need to do to get yourself ready. And, um, you know, I've heard it said that, you know, it's a selfish pursuit, you know, being a professional athlete. I, you know, I don't, I don't see it like that. I see it as, you know, you, you're too, like I taught my kids discipline, that's for sure. Yep. You know, what it takes, and I want to set a good example in that respect. But, um, you know, I guess, you know, in, in the end, um, you know, the, the charity stuff was born out of me seeing what Max was going through and realising that there were so many people in need and I needed to focus my energy there. And, and what it did, it was amazing. Uh, you know, the last couple of years of my career, I've, I've, I thought I played the best football I'd ever played. And, you know, in my last year, I'm 34 years old, I'm, you know, slower than I was, um, but I'm playing the best football I've ever played. You know, it's just my, my whole focus was different. Yeah. I was still focused on what I needed to do to be a professional athlete, but I was probably more focused on making the players around me better, giving everything I could to them to make them better, which in turn made me better, you know? And, and, and that's a, I, I think you can do that in every walk of life, yep. you know? And, you know, I, I read a, a quote from um, John Wooden, a, 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 a ex-coach from the US, you know, just I read a lot of biographies and he said, you know, true greatness doesn't come from being great. True greatness comes from using what you're great at Yes. To make someone else better. That's true greatness. I thought, wow, that's, that, 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 that made me better. You know, as, a, as an athlete, it made me better yeah. realigning my focus to not about just me working on me and just forget everyone else. I've just got to be the best. It's like, okay, I'm, I'm good at this. How can I make this other guy, how can I lift him up? You know, and, it, and in turn, it made our team better, it made me better. And, you know, we had a great year. Yeah, well done. Mate, you mentioned um, Survivor. What yeah. was that experience like? <laughs> <laughs> Survivor. Survivor, man, I tell you. It's a, it's a you know, you, you go into this game yep. where you've got to lie, cheat, and steal, basically. But I just couldn't Pro bring myself to do it, things. really. Yeah, I was <laughs> going to say, <laughs> it's like, it's not I just had this person, internal so, battle. Yeah. This internal battle, like, from day one. Even the first tribal council, I came back from the first tribal council, I went in angry at everyone. Yeah. Because we had to vote someone off, but that's the game, you know? And second time around, it was a lot different. I realised what you need to do, and it's a game. And, but, you know, I made some of the best, my, you know, I made some lifetime friends out of that yes. game. You know, Steve, um, Willis, Commando, you know, Moana Hope, just an amazing human being. Um, you know, Mark Hurler or Tarzan, everybody knows him as Tarzan. You know, just some beautiful friends that, you know, we all got in there and we sort of fought together and, you know, we had a crack and, you know, Dave, who won the last in the All-Stars, like, just a great guy. And just some really good people. Um, and, and I loved it, you know, I'd do it again tomorrow if they yeah. asked me. Um, it's, a fun, it's a fun game because you can go in there and you can sort of play a character or you can sort of do stuff in there that you wouldn't do in real life. Like, I'm not going to go and lie to people in real life. You can do it in there. Yeah. You're, you're almost expected to. Well, I was going to say, yeah. what are some of the lessons out of it? But the, probably a lesson is that you can be a character that you... Yeah, you're not yeah. You can, you can go in there and have fun. Yeah. Uh, and, and, you know, the second time around I did, you know, the first time around, um, you know, I got, I got blindsided pretty bad and it rattled me. Yeah. I've got to tell you, it rattled me. I came out of it and I was just sort of shaken up a bit. Um, but then probably what hurt me the most was just that, like, it really affected me was, was I, I said something in the last tribal vote and, I, and I, the way I said it, I, I shouldn't have said it the way yep. I said it and it was taken out of context and all the fans sort of took it the wrong way. But I said it, so, I, you know, I've got to wear it. But then the, the, the social the media backlash back, yeah. was insane. And it, and, it, and, it, and, it, and it hit me pretty hard. I had to shut social media. My brother, ran, like, I've, I've posted this thing on social media. My brother got straight on the phone. He goes, mate, what is going on? I'm like, oh, dude. 
what? He's, what he's, like, he's like, what? He's like, mate, that is not, what are you posting that stuff for? That's not your stuff. Oh, mate, I'm getting, just getting heaps of heat from you. So, mate, get off social media because I'm coming to see you. Come over and sat down and had a bit of a chat about it. And, um, yeah, it just rattled me, you know. Like, I just, I didn't think so many people could hate me all at once, yep. you know. And, um, yeah, it, it affected me to the point where I had to go and get some, some help over it. You yep. know, because I was just like thinking, man, I've really screwed up here, and um, you know, it's just on my final vote. You know, I voted for the person that ended up winning, and it was it was split five four. And to be honest, <laughs> in all honesty, like that vote that I cast, I didn't think it was going to have any bearing on the game. Yeah, okay. And it ended up being like a deciding huge, vote. Yeah. Well, well, everybody said it was my vote that was a deciding vote. I mean, there was there were four other people obviously that voted for Shane, and. Um, and what really hurt me about it was the fact that I got hammered, but it also hurt me because the other person that could have won, Sean, was a really close friend of mine. And I'm like, oh man, I've just cost a 500 grand. <laughs> We've had some deep and meaningful conversations over that. Um, but at least you've talked about it. Right? Yeah, we have. And, 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 and you know what? You know, and it comes back, it is a game too. Yeah, you it's know, a game. Like it's... And, and mate, I tell you, like, I've, I've, mate, we, I've, I've been with Sean. And we've been in, I've been in tears talking to her about it and we're hugging and she's like, it's all right, you know, it's all right. But I just felt like, you know, I didn't think Shane would get the votes. And, and the other four people that voted for her, like, they really had no reason to vote for her. Yeah. <laughs> you know, but um, I was the one that wore it. So anyway, it was a tough time. It was, but the game itself, the people involved, the cast are one thing. But what, what's amazing about that game is, is the crew, yeah. the, the people behind the scenes that put the effort into that show. They are some of the best the humans that I've met. Yeah. You know, like the guys that are building the sets, you know, and you don't meet them during the game. Like I only met a few of them afterwards and a few of the cameramen and, you know, the soundies and these guys just, they work their tail off yeah. to create this show that I think, you know, is the best reality show out there. I mean, it's the original reality yes. TV show. Yeah, look, they, they do an amazing job and, and they all just buy into to want to create this great show, which makes you want to do well in the show or, or you know play the game in the show because everyone's you know they're away from their families for three months you know setting up and you know it's pretty crazy yeah it's um it's insane but I uh, loved it but uh, yeah you just can't trust anyone and mate, <laughs> how's and how's surviving life now mate like you know yeah, how, how is life for you I'm busy you know fast forward yeah busy so down the track so. You know, a lot of stuff, a lot of good stuff came out of me doing Survivor, you know, which was great. I mean, I didn't win the half a million dollars that the winner gets, but, um, you know, I've been able to write, you know, out of that came the opportunity to write a book and, you know, our, our charity got a lot of publicity. So, um, mate, it's been, uh, it's been a really, really busy, you know, five or so years since the first time I did Survivor. You know, we started a sports management business that, uh, you know, look after young athletes yep. now. And, um, yeah, that's been, that's been a blast, you know trying to sort of guide and, and help these young kids realise a dream. Yep. It's been pretty cool. And are you being harsh on them like your father was, but in a respectful way? Well, in a respectful or, way, I yes. just, you know, I, I'd tell them, you know, like, the first thing I asked him is, what's, what, what, you know, what, why are you going to be yep. one of those 16 yep. that get the job? Ah, oh, the, the circle of the lessons. You know, it's yep. like, why? You know, like, what, why is a club going to look at you any different to yep. the other thousand kids that want to be a part of that club you know it's important you got to you got to separate yourself from the herd yeah and uh if you're not prepared to do it you're not prepared to make the sacrifices and do what it takes and particularly in this day and age probably not so much when i played i mean it was but everything's monitored now yeah you know so everything, everything yep. you know everything's monitored so you, you can't cheat you can't lie your way and talent's not going to get you there yeah if you haven't got the work ethic and you're not and trustworthy the your coach yep. is not going to be able to trust you and you know you may as well you know, get on the end of a shovel and go start digging ditches because that's where you're going to end up. I've got some rapid fire questions yeah, to, 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 bring it, to, to bring it to close. Best lesson um, you've learnt in life so far? Well, best lesson I've learnt um, that it's more rewarding to give than to take. Yeah? I like that one. To give than receive. You know, it's more rewarding to give than receive. You know, it's, and and the other lesson that I've learnt is because I was a bad receiver. Yep. Okay. It's important yep. to, to receive yep. Yep. because if you don't, you're taken away from that person that's trying to give. Yep. Yeah, you know? that's true. And, yep. and I think, um, you know, if you receive with the right heart, then, you know, no gift is too much and no gift is too little. 
Yeah, no, well said. Mate, I'm sure there's many, but is there a best day of your life that stands out? Best day of my life? Well, I don't know. <laughs> Do I, I probably should say you know, when my kids were born. But really, like, I mean, I've, I've just lived a blessed life. You know? yeah. like, I just look over my life and the moments that I've had. You know, I, I remember, like, I played in some of the best stadiums around the world, you know, like I remember running out like at Ellis Park when, you know, Australia was playing South Africa in, in Johannesburg and just this 50,000 seat stadium, it's built by the stands are that steep. Just running out there just thinking, wow, man, this is, like, how, how, this is amazing, you know, and, and even like, but then I reflect back to like playing first 15 for the Southport School. Yep. Then the GPS rugby competition, just running out, school all like, lined up, you run through the tunnel. I get more of a, I got more of a buzz doing that. You know what I mean? Like, because there's so much emotion there, you, you're so connected to everybody. You know, it's, it's really cool. But yeah, man, I, thousands of. Good, <laughs> I don't, I don't want to gloat, but I got thousands of good oh, days. Oh no, no. <laughs> and actually, I just want to share one, one, one of my, no, no favourite moments was when, when I played for the first 15 and scored a try against St Peter's yeah. and I came on off the bench yeah. and yeah mate just you know I, I constantly remember that moment mate, well, in the no, sports contents. No, we beat Nudgy at Nudgy and I scored yeah. a try that day no one gave us a hope and mate, that day created a rivalry between those two schools yeah. we got in the middle of the school ground and did our war cry as a team and they hated it but yeah those times man the mates you make you know along the way they're just brilliant. Yeah, brilliant. Mate, what makes you laugh? Um, Carl Barron. <laughs> <laughs> he makes me laugh. Mate, my wife, hey, my wife is yeah. a card, I tell you. She's got the most out, out there sense of humour. Like, I'm a bit of a square, you know, like I, I'm pretty like straight down the line. She's just out there, you know. Her, her whole family are like performers. I mean, her dad's a barrister, they, like oh, owns wow. chambers yep. in Sydney, but he's also an Elvis performer. My, my wife's sister, Went to uh, acting school in New York City, and she lives over, over there now. And she's she's just a talent, like a writer, yeah. and so creative. You know, her brother is a graphic artist, but super creative. <laughs> it's funny he's done all the voiceovers for my ways. Oh. <laughs> like he's hilarious. So he's he's like um, yeah. So my my wife's family, they're just out there, and and sometimes I look at my wife and I'm like, that's not funny. <laughs> but actually, it's hilarious. But I'm just too too square, you know. Like, but she's she she makes me laugh every day. She's a crazy woman. I must say, mate, you've you've brought up your wife quite a lot. She's obviously a strong woman and means yeah. a lot to you because she's obviously picked up when mm. uh, things aren't right and then makes you laugh. Yeah. And yeah, what a lady. Mate, I'll tell you. There, there was one time in my life. There was one time in my life when football wasn't a sanctuary for me. Yep. We had a little break in our relationship when we first got together after about three months. Um, we sort of had a break and we were apart for a couple of months. And for those two months, I couldn't think of anything but her. Yep. And I just couldn't, like football wasn't doing it. I was just a mess and trying to rekindle this relationship. And um, man, she is a special woman. Yeah. She's been there for me through all the good, the bad and the indifferent. And um, man, it's right or die. Yeah. You know, that's it. Sounds like she cares and <laughs> yeah, loves you, mate. Absolutely. Mate, is there any sport that you couldn't master? Um, <laughs> chess? I'm pretty handy at a lot of things. Can I tell you? <laughs> chess is it. <laughs> you know, mate, my son Max is a chess player. Oh, is he? Oh, no. And he's been kicking my butt. Yeah. And I was just doing my head in. He's like three moves ahead of me. Chess is it, man. <laughs> Are you on the chess.com app? Have you I'm not, read, like, you know, mate. I'm, I'm, get on there, mate. Well, it's, no, uh, mate you it'll, know it'll humble you pretty quickly. He's been, he's been kicking my butt, like, so bad. And this is my 15-year-old autistic boy. He's in the chess club at school. He plays all the time. And I'm just, I'm not even, it's like, if I'm in the, if, if he's playing in the NRL, I'm not even playing A grade at the local park. I'm playing under sevens. Like, I'm so far behind. And it's frustrating me, because I don't like losing anything. And he knows he can beat me. He's like, chess, dad? I'm like, all right. <laughs> <laughs> it's, uh, it's, it's humbling, it. mate. It's, it's, hum hum it's yeah. humbling. Mate, what's, uh, I get, and thank you for getting involved with Walk for Awareness, mate. What's, you know, why was it important for you to, to be a part of us or our charity? But I, th I, think, I, th I think the awareness, like, I, I love, I love the, the Mental Awareness Foundation. It's like awareness encompasses everything. 
it's not just about me being aware, it's about everybody being aware. It's not about me being aware of my mental state, it's about everybody being aware. And I love, I love, that, I love that name. Yeah, thank you. You know, I, I love it, because it is about me being aware of how my wife's feeling, how my best mate's feeling, how my brother's feeling. I, I want to be aware of that stuff. It's not just about me. Man, if I lost one of those people close to me through mental health, I don't know how, I don't know how I'd handle it. Break, yeah, yeah. It'd kill me. You know, like, it would break me. Like, I, I just, I want to be so on top of it. And you guys, are, you guys are at the forefront of that. And, you know, I couldn't think of a better crew to be, be aligned with. Thank you, mate. And last question. Mate, if there's a message that you could get out to millions of people, what would that be? Um, well, it'd probably along the same lines of what I've been talking about is like, yeah, yeah, make sure you're okay. But make sure you understand what those symptoms are for someone who isn't, so that you can ask the question. Yeah, that's you know, And don't be afraid to ask that question. And don't be afraid to follow that question up. You know, because you know a lot of people they'll just brush it aside the first time you ask. No, no, I'm good, good. Yeah, sweet mate. Yeah, I'm all right. Really? Yeah. <laughs> you know, like the follow up. Th yep. Things are different. Things seem a little different. You know, like, don't be afraid to, and, and look, you know, I'm, I'm fortunate in a sense that, you know, I've got a, I've got a, a, a you know, a few psychologists that I've seen that I, that I, that I've really connected with and I love, that I'm happily, I'm, I'll happily recommend to a friend, you know, it's not bad to find out, you know, a few good ones around your area just so that you can recommend if someone needs it because, you now again, you don't want that burden to be on your shoulders because you know a lot of people out there they'll take on your problems yeah but it'll break them you know like it's it's important to to know where you can sort of follow through with some professional help yeah and mate what, what i'm hearing from there is strength the strength to step up and ask the question are you okay or the strength to actually talk to your best mate or a friend that you feel comfortable with and say hey i need some help and, yeah. and mate that's a beautiful message matt I'll do the fist pump. Thank you very much, mate. Thank you for sharing and, and being open. And, and you can see Matt's very transparent and he is here willing to break that taboo about mental health and the stigma behind it all. But, mate, we can uh, say thank you enough. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, if you're watching this, please like and share. Get involved in Walk for Awareness. Uh, we are Sunday the 10th of October 2021. The beauty is is that you can walk with us in Brisbane, which uh, I, I, I'll, I'll be hope, here. Yeah, perfect. Matt, Matt's going to be there. But the, a great thing is, is that it doesn't matter where you are in Australia or the world, you can walk anywhere. So if you're in Newcastle or Sydney or Melbourne, you can get behind us and help us support us and walk with us on that day. So if you're watching this, please like and share, and we'll see you in October. You betcha. Thank you.